All right. Welcome everybody to the AOML Virtual Open House. My name is Heidi Van Buskirk and I'm going to be moderating today's webinar. This series is brought to you by NOAA's Atlantic Oceanographic and Meteorological Laboratory, or AOML, here in Miami, Florida. It's designed to help you get to know AOML and some of the incredible experts that we have here at our lab. To celebrate Earth Day this year, which is on April 22nd, we're bringing you an inside look to some of the groundbreaking research our scientists are doing. Throughout these webinars, we'll explore hurricanes, ocean currents, extreme weather, and coastal ecosystems. Today, we'll be exploring the exciting world of hurricane research as our scientists take us through what it's like to fly directly into a hurricane and what technologies they use to collect data that goes into forecasts. We have a few guidelines before I welcome our first speaker. You're all muted because we have a lot of people on the line and we want to make sure that everybody can hear our speaker. However, if there is a questions box on your GoToWebinar panel, please write your questions for our speakers there. We encourage you to ask questions as we go along and our speakers will be taking the time to answer them at the end of each presentation. We may not be able to get to all of the questions, but we will do our best to answer as many as possible. Now it's time for me to turn it over to our first speaker, John Zwizlak, who is going to tell you a little bit about our hurricane field program. Over to you, John. Thank you. I will just get this set up. Okay, that should be all set up. All right, so thank you and good evening to everybody for joining and we appreciate your interest in, in what ALML uh, does. And I wanna kick us off uh, this evening by talking about just broadly our hurricane field program, which is a program that we fly uh, annually uh, at HRD with, uh, with a number of collaborators, both within NOAA, outside NOAA and, and with academia. And this is a program that we've actually been flying for decades now, ever since the 1960s. And the real premise of this program is to collect data using the NOAA Hurricane Hunter aircraft, which I'll mention here, and collect that data to not only understand storms, but to ultimately improve forecast of those storms. So before I go into what the Hurricane Field Program is, just want to introduce myself. My name is Dr. John Zwizlak. I'm a hurricane scientist at the University of Miami's Cooperative Institute for Marine and Atmospheric Studies. You may be wondering why is a University of Miami scientist uh, talking at an ALML uh, event? Well, ALML is one of a number of uh, NOAA laboratories that has an associated cooperative institute. So this cooperative institute at the University of Miami is actually uh, NOAA funded. And so scientists like myself at the university collaborate and sit at a NOAA laboratory, as we do with uh, ALML, and we do research that supports NOAA's mission. So just about me, um, I've been a weather weenie my entire life. Uh, I think some of my first real books were on weather observations, and so I had an interest in hurricanes as a kid as well, and uh, the other great passion was flying, was aviation. So uh, to say that I'm living the dream job would be an, an understatement because uh, I found my career intersecting hurricanes and research and weather and, and flying, and I've been able and fortunate um, to be a part of a number of airborne programs, including this one at NOAA now for several years. So in the lower right, you're gonna see just some video of what it's like to fly in the eye of a hurricane from our P3 aircraft, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, it is a remarkable experience. Uh, it's a humbling experience, since many of these storms are obviously also extraordinarily uh, dangerous in terms of what they, they bring to communities, the hazards, um, but it is, uh, some beautiful sights that we see, particularly when you see here, like the stadium effect of a category five hurricane. So this is a program, a hurricane program that we operate annually from July uh, to October. And we really have three main goals here. The first one is really a basic understanding. What are the storm processes? Why is a storm doing what it's doing? So we're interested in why they form, why they strengthen, why they weaken, why they get bigger, why they get smaller. And then the second component is we use these aircraft observations that we're collecting for real-time monitoring purposes. So the, the idea is to sample the intensity of the storm, the structure of the storm, how big is the storm, how big is the wind field, what hazards are they bringing? And then we deliver that information to the National Hurricane Center. And then the third component is these forecast models. So we're taking the observations and then we're sending them the models. And so what we do is we evaluate models, the forecast, to see how accurate they may be with the observations that we take in an actual storm. 
And then we also do what we call data simulation. So we actually take the observations, we put them into the initialization of the model to make that initialization of where the model starts look more realistic, and then that'll help make the forecast better. And so ultimately, that is our mission, to improve hurricane forecast. The track of the storm, the intensity of the storm, and the hazards associated with the storm. And so Rob Rogers will talk in a second about the specific observations that we take with these airplanes, but I wanna talk about the airplanes themselves, so the platforms that we use. So you may be familiar with these, but uh, at NOAA, we have a business jet-like airplane called the G4. It is nicknamed Gonzo. We have nicknamed from Muppets. Now, this airplane that you see on the left here, and you see a video from the airplane at center, this airplane does not penetrate the storm core. We typically don't put this in the eye wall or the eye of a hurricane. It doesn't like a lot of turbulence. What we do is we fly this airplane at about 45,000 feet around the storm. Okay, so if you look at the bottom figure there, you'll see a typical flight track, as we call them, from the G4, and the red is the flight track. And what you see is that we spend a considerable amount of time in, in the environment, the surrounding area around the storm, okay? Not so much in the inner core of the storm where you see this, this, the cyclone there with the Hurricane Jerry and all of its cloud. So the idea here is to get observations around the storm, and the primary goal being to improve track forecast. So all those Ds that you see at the bottom, those are drop sounds that we release from the airplane. Rob will talk about the drop sounds in a second but we're essentially seeing what air mass is and what flow is the storm heading into and what might affect its track. And then we also try to get as close to the storm core as possible. We don't get in the core, we're not in the eye, we're not in the eye wall, but we get very near it into what we call this near environment. So we're gonna do a circumnavigation around the core of the storm. So if you look at that bottom image, you'll see a hexagon around the main cloud field. That's that circumnavigation. And so the idea is we wanna get into that near environment and see how the storm is interacting with its surrounding and how that may affect its future strength and its future track. Now, what airplane do we send into the storm? Well, that is our P3. This is the workhorse for the in-storm sampling. It can handle the high winds, the high rain, the high turbulence that we experience in the rain bands and the eye wall and the eye of the storm. So this airplane is a, is a P3. It was a subfinder built in the 1960s, uh, converted into a scientific laboratory. We have two of these P3 aircraft. One is nicknamed Kerman, the other one is nicknamed Miss Piggy. Now this airplane is a four engine turboprop, so it's a very sturdy airplane. We typically fly this from about a thousand feet before a storm forms. Uh, and then in a hurricane, we get up to about eight to 10,000 feet. And then we can even fly this airplane up to 25,000 feet and get even above that and, and, uh, and get deeper observations over a deeper layer in the atmosphere. So how do we fly it? Well, we do a series of passes through the storm with this airplane or bisects the storm. So if I turn your attention to the, to the lower left here, you're gonna see what it looks like to fly from a data perspective. So we're doing a number of passes. So we're starting the outside of the storm, we're flying through all that rain band activity. We get to the eye wall of the storm, that most intense wind and rain that we're gonna experience, and then we get into the eye. And so we're measuring the peak intensity, how big is the storm, what is the minimum sea level pressure at the center of the storm, and then we're gonna go out of the storm, back out into the environment, and then we're gonna do a repeated one, kind of rotating those passes. And if you put them all together, you get this full horizontal picture of the storm. But the beauty of the observations we take is we also get vertical depth. And so this next image is just slicing through the storm from the surface up to a higher level in the atmosphere. And this is from our tail Doppler radar. Rob will mention that in just a second, but we're essentially doing a CAT scan, a 3D picture of the wind and rain in the storm. And the ultimate goal is to look at inner core processes. How is all this rain and wind evolving and how does it impact how it forms and how a storm perhaps strengthens or weakens? And so how do we do our job on the airplane? Well, you'll see a video on the lower right here. That's some of the activity and us at our workstations on the P3. But what we're doing first and foremost, of course, is collecting observations. The instruments are running continuously on the airplane. And then as onboard scientists, we're then quality controlling the data. So we get the data and you can see this in the right, they're looking at data on our workstations and we're figuring out what data is good and what data is bad. We only send good data off the airplane. So we're quality controlling the data and we're sending it off the airplane. Where are we sending it to? We're sending it to first and foremost to the National Hurricane Center. They're interested in the real time state of the storm. How big is it? How strong is it? What's its structure? So we deliver that information, that'll help the Hurricane Center update their forecasts, their advisories, and issue watches and warnings. And then we also deliver this information to the National Centers for Environmental Prediction. Okay, this is the modeling center at NOAA. 
This is where the observations are going into the models through that data simulation I talked about earlier and helping initialize the model with a more realistic storm and create a better forecast. But in parallel, as researchers, we're, again, we're, we're learning how to better initialize the forecast models with the aircraft observations. And then we're evaluating those models. We're trying to see how we can make the models better using that grounded advice that we get from the data we collect in the actual hurricane. And then second, we're interested in new technologies. You're gonna hear from Joe about some new technologies in a minute, but we wanna know where are we missing? What gaps in the storm have we not covered and we need to cover in the future? Not only to help us understand the storm, but to predict it better. So we're always seeking new technologies on board the airplane. And then finally, again, that basic understanding, what we call basic research, understanding the core processes that drive these storms. And so the aircraft observations over all these decades have really helped their advance their understanding of the storms and helped us forecast them better. So this is a broad overview of what we call the hurricane field program. And specifically, we call it the Advancing the Prediction of Hurricanes Experiment, or AFEX. This is a, a new acronym for this year, although we have been essentially flying under these goals now for decades and we have made great advancements in forecasting and understanding of hurricanes because of these aircraft observations. So I thank you for listening to this broad overview. You're going to hear more specifics soon but for now I, I thank you and I will take a few questions. All right thank you for that presentation John that was fantastic. We do have a couple questions rolling into the chat here. Um, one of them being somebody is wondering if the pilots are also doing research or data collection or are they just solely flying the plane? Uh, they have a pretty active job on the airplane of just flying the airplane. Uh, it, we typically carry three pilots and two flight engineers. The flight engineers are responsible for the mechanics of the airplane. Of course, the pilots are flying the airplane. That allows them to rotate. But it is a, it is a pretty substantial job flying uh, through a hurricane. It requires both pilots flying as well as the flight engineer. Um, but their job is critical, of course, keeping us safe on the airplane, putting us through the storm in a safe environment and helping us get the data that we need to collect. But they are very busy up there, just as we are in the back. Very nice, yeah, I'm sure it's a very important job. And somebody else is wondering, how many people can fit onto the P3? It looks like a pretty large aircraft. Yeah, the airplane is, is pretty large. We can typically carry uh, up to 19 to 20 people on board the airplane at any one time. Of course, it gets a little bit tight in there. Uh, somebody might have to sit in the galley of the airplane. Uh, on an average mission, though, we typically have about 13 to 14 uh, crew members, uh, 10 of them being uh, aircraft operations center who operate the aircraft, and typically we could carry three to four scientists on board the airplane for the various data collection efforts. Nice. And somebody else in the chat is wondering, are there ever spots for volunteers or citizen scientists aboard the Hurricane Hunter aircraft? We, we do get that question a lot. Uh, it is hard to get on, on board the airplane um, unless you're you know, a scientist who's interested in data. I will say, though, that we do fly uh, members of the media, uh, newspapers, uh, television, of course, um, as well as uh, 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 various VIPs, congressmen, who, who, of course, are interested in the program. So we do have uh, members of the public fly, but it is awfully challenging uh, outside of uh, outside of those to get on board the airplane. But I do encourage you, we do hurricane awareness tours. Um, so the airplane uh, does a tour. If, now, in the pandemic environment, uh, these tours have ceased. But in the future, look for those hurricane awareness tours. Uh, those go around the East Coast, uh, the Gulf, uh, the Gulf states, as well as also um, in the Caribbean, and that's a good opportunity to talk to the actual crew members uh, on board the airplane and, and get to experience the airplane itself. Uh, now, in a storm, that's a little bit different, but those are great opportunities to to really get up and close personal with the aircraft. Nice, very exciting. And if somebody was looking into being a pilot for the Hurricane Hunters, is there a resource that you could provide for them for more information? Uh, absolutely, and uh, uh, perhaps we can we can put this in the chat. Uh, so uh, there's usually two pilots come from two routes. Uh, a lot of them uh, are veterans uh, of the Navy or Air Force and who have flown. Uh, some of them have actually flown in the Navy, P3s. Um, but quite a number of the pilots uh, at NOAA actually have come through the NOAA Corps, which is a uniform branch of service. Um, and so you apply to NOAA Corps, you, you typically do basic training through the U.S. Coast Guard. You'll spend a couple of years on a NOAA ship um, that just like the aircraft is is supporting um, ocean uh, and, and sometimes atmospheric research and marine research uh, around the globe. So you spend a little time on the ship and then you can apply to the uh, airborne uh, portion of the NOAA Corps and perhaps end up flying. You don't need any flight experience at the NOAA Corps. They can actually start you right from your first time at the controls all the way up to flying the P-3. We actually have a pilot who never flew an airplane when he joined the NOAA Corps and he's now flying the P-3s. Oh, very cool. Thank you for that answer. 
And one final question. I'm sure flying into hurricanes is a very exciting job. Have you had any scary moments before on the plane? I don't I don't know if I call them scary. They're certainly uncomfortable moments uh, on the airplane. We we trust in our crew. We have a we have some of the best pilots you can find on the planet. We have the best maintained airplane on the planet. We have great uh, uh, maintenance crew. So uh, we know we're going to a safe environment. We take the safety very seriously. So I would say we're never afraid on the airplane, but certainly I would say that there are some moments um, when you never thought an airplane can maneuver uh, like that and, and turbulence and some of the wind they've experienced. So uncomfortable, yes, perhaps a little bit air sick at times, yes, but never uh, afraid. Awesome, well, thank you very much. And if anybody else has any other questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. John, thank you so much for your presentation. And we're gonna throw it off to our next speaker, Rob Rogers. Okay, thanks, Heidi. Uh, let me uh, get my screen up. Okay, can you all see it? Yes, we can. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, John, for giving that great introduction to the uh, field program that we do every year. Um, I'm gonna extend a little bit of what John talked about and focus on the, the instrumentation and, and the data that we collect with the instruments and how we use that data to, to you know, improve our understanding and prediction of hurricane uh, activity. So first, a little bit about me. Uh, this is a picture of me on the P3 from a long time ago when I was a, quite a bit younger. But uh, like John, I'm kind of a weather weenie. I've been fascinated with severe weather since childhood. Uh, hurricanes, tornadoes, blizzards, you have it. I was always fascinated with that. I did start at AOML uh, after getting my PhD from Penn State. Um, so I've been down here in Miami at AOML for 23 years now. I've done more than 200 eyewall penetrations. And if you count uh, missions into systems that are weaker than hurricanes, it's probably closer to 300 or 350. Um, and the work that I do, I, I conduct research on hurricane structure and intensity change using the data that, that John described and what I'll talk about as well um, from the NOAA aircraft. And that data and that research that I do and, and others certainly at AOML do uh, is supports NOAA's mission of, of making better forecasts of hurricanes. And, and so one of the key forecast challenges I'm going to talk about is uh, that challenge of predicting hurricane intensity. So if you look at this graph here on the left, uh, what, what we're looking at here is how the forecast error from the National Hurricane Center of track, hurricane track and hurricane intensity has changed over a 25 year period from 1994 to 2018. So the green line shows how much the track forecast error has improved uh, over that 25 year period. And the red line shows how much the intensity forecast error has improved or, or reduced basically. And so one thing that you can see, first of all, is that the track line slopes down quite a bit more than what the intensity uh, error line does. So specifically, the track forecasts have, have reduced by about 70% over that uh, 24, 25 year period, whereas the intensity forecast is only reduced by about 30%. So there's definitely a lag in terms of our improvement of intensity forecasts over that time period. And if you only consider hurricanes that undergo rapid intensification, which is basically defined as a, a hurricane that increases by two Saffir-Simpson categories in a 24 hour period, uh, that intensity forecast error for those rapidly intensifying storms is actually three times greater than uh, uh, forecast errors for non-rapidly intensifying hurricanes. So that's a real challenge. And it's a real nightmare scenario for forecasters. If you can imagine a hurricane, a category one hurricane run on the doorstep of Miami, let's say, uh, and suddenly it, it rapidly intensifies to a category four just before landfall. That's a real nightmare scenario for both the forecaster and obviously for the public as well. So it's a real challenge and something that, that has been a real focus for our research uh, for quite a long time actually. So then the question is, why is it that hurricane intensity forecasting is so difficult? Well, if you consider all the physical processes that, you know, John talked about that, uh, all the physical processes that are really responsible for determining how strong a hurricane is, they really span a, a multitude of, of uh, spatial scales. They range from uh, processes and structures that can cover thousands of kilometers of continent wide or, or ocean basin wide scale in the upper atmosphere, down to kind of a hurricane vortex scale, down to like 100 kilometers or so coming down even further in size to, to just on the scale of individual thunderstorms, which might be one to two kilometers across and coming even further down to a turbulent scale. So really we're talking, you know, fractions of a kilometer, you know, micron scale even, even if you consider, you know, the rain droplets and ice crystals and, and those sorts of things, all of those physical structures and physical processes, we have to sample and observe and, and understand how they interact with each other. So it's a real challenge you know, characterizing and understanding these processes and their interactions are really key uh, steps in improving our forecast. And 
What's great about the aircraft that John talked about is that they provide a unique opportunity to study these process, processes across all of these scales. So John talked about the aircraft. We have three primary uh, uh, crewed aircraft. We have the two P3s and the G4. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the instruments specifically. So on uh, each of those aircraft, we have what are called in situ measurements, but those are measurements that actually take data like by physically sensing that, that, that parameter. And so the, the, the fields that we measure with the in situ probes on the aircraft include the winds, temp, uh, wind speed and direction, uh, pressure, temperature, and moisture. Uh, we also have what we call expendables. And so those are things that we launch from the aircraft and they just are, are you know, lost basically into the ocean. Uh, drop sons are one example of that. Uh, I'll, I'll show you an example of that in a minute. Uh, but it has also a picture of a drop sign. So you can see that there are little tubes that drop out underneath the aircraft. Uh, I think John showed uh, some uh, examples of flight patterns with drop sign locations on them with a parachute. Uh, and so those drop sons report back, you know, temperature, pressure, moisture, and, and winds. And we also have aircraft launched ocean probes. So those are probes that, that are launched from the aircraft, fall to the ocean and measure sea surface temperature and subsurface temperature and current and, and um, um, salinity as well. We also have what we call the remote sensors. So unlike in situ measurements, these are, are instruments that actually send pulses of electromagnetic uh, magnetic radiation uh, that then whatever we get back to the sensor itself can give us information depending on what frequency we're looking at. And so some examples of that include the tail Doppler radar, uh, what's called the step frequency microwave radiometer. I'll talk about that in a minute. A scanning radar altimeter, which gives you measurements of the, the ocean roughness and, and, and allows you to see what the wave field looks like and a Doppler wind LIDAR. Uh, so that actually uses laser technology to measure uh, whether it's wind speed or even temperature and moisture, to looking at really fine scale particles that, that the radar typically cannot see. So these are just some examples of what a radar antenna looks like, as well as what the LIDAR looks like on a, on a P3. And finally, uh, you know, we've been talking about crewed aircraft, but there's also uncrewed aircraft, uh, kind of the drone technology, and Joe's gonna talk about that after me. Uh, but the two kind of major categories of that include uncrewed aerial systems or UASs and ocean gliders. So what are some of the instruments? Uh, here are some examples in terms of the airborne radar. So on the P3 aircraft, um, there are three primary uh, radars. Uh, the red cone that you see here, that's called the nose radar. So that looks forward in front of the aircraft as it's flying. And so that's primarily used by the pilots for uh, you know, safe navigation through rough weather. We don't use that typically in our research, but the, the radars that we do use in our research include that blue circle you see underneath the aircraft at the LF, that's called lower fuselage or it's kind of the belly radar. So that scans horizontally around the aircraft as it's flying. And uh, that gives us a, a measure of the, the re reflectivity and the rainfall uh, as the plane is flying through the storm in a horizontal sense. And then the other uh, radar, you see the green circle, that's the tail radar, the TA radar. So that basically as the plane is flying, it's scanning uh, perpendicular to the flight track of the aircraft. And so John mentioned the, the term CAT scan. It's a radar that really does provide like a, a nice picture of, of the inner core uh, guts of the storm, if you will. Uh, so it's a nice uh, way to get a, a real sense of what the inner core structure, at least in terms of the, the rainfall, the reflectivity and the wind field. It doesn't measure temperature and moisture though. So here's a picture uh, again of what the lower fuselage radar looks like. You see the little red circle, that's that belly radar underneath the, uh, underneath the P3. Here's just an example of an image that you can get from, an, from the LF. So this is showing you again, reflectivity, uh, giving you a sense of the rainfall. So you know the, the warmer the colors, the bright reds, that's really high reflectivity, really heavy rain rate, often associated with higher winds, although we can't see that directly with the LF radar. But you can see structures like spiral rain bands and the eye wall uh, with the LF radar. Uh, the other radar, the tail Doppler radar. So again, that's that red circle is showing you the antenna on the uh, tail Doppler radar on the G4. And again, this gives you, uh, again, the vertical structure. So this is take, basically taking a vertical slice through the eye wall of a hurricane. And so you can see the eye wall can, kind of sloping out in, in both directions. And then it's kind of looks like a bowl structure, right? So you can see in the middle, uh, we don't have that absence of reflectivity of showing you what the eye looks like. So you get a sense as to how wide the eye wall is, how much the eye wall is sloping with height. Uh, it's just a really nice depiction, again, of the inner core structure. Uh, the GPS drops on. So here I've got a, a, a hopefully you can see that. This is a really about how the size of the drops on. It doesn't weigh that much. It's maybe about a pound or two. Uh, so we release these from the aircraft underneath the aircraft. And as it drops down, a parachute opens up and then it falls uh, kind of slowly to the surface. And as it's falling again, it's reporting back 
all these measurements like temperature and pressure and, and wind. And so this is just an example of three separate drop zones that were released in the eye wall of a, of a hurricane. Uh, so you can see going from about three kilometer altitude, about 10,000 feet down to the surface, you can see you know, a lot of variation in the wind speeds with each of these three drop zones, but you can see some examples from two of the drop zones at least, where the winds actually exceed category five wind speed at about uh, you know, 1,500 feet or so above the surface. So you can see a lot of variation, especially as you get really near the surface. So it's you know, very important to be mindful of what the winds look like, not just at the surface, but just slightly above the surface, especially, especially if you live in a high rise. Uh, you, know, you may be experiencing very different winds at you know, 1,000 feet versus at the surface. There's a video uh, showing what it looks like to release a drop zone. So that what I just showed you, this is a, one of the uh, aircraft operators releasing the drop zone. He puts it in a tube, seals it back up, and you can't hear, but there's a whoosh sound as the drop zone goes underneath the aircraft. Obviously, it, it's a uh, release based on the fact that you have higher pressure within the aircraft versus in the atmosphere. You know, you're flying at altitude there. So that higher pressure basically, basically moves the drop zone out underneath the aircraft and you get that information as the drop zone falls to the surface. Another instrument is called the Step Frequency Microwave Radiometer. So this is a picture of what that, that uh, antenna looks like underneath the aircraft here. And so what the SFMR uh, measures is it basically measures the brightness of the ocean surface. And the brighter the ocean surface, the stronger the wind speeds. And so it's a nice way to get a measure of how strong the winds are right underneath the aircraft. It's very helpful, very important for the National Hurricane Center. And so these are just some examples of some of the measurements that we can take with the SFMR. So the left panel, that little squiggly line there, looks like a, you know, a bunch of uh, different triangles. That's showing the flight track of the P3 aircraft. And then on the right, you see time series of both winds at the flight level in red and winds at the surface in black measured by the SFMR. So you can see multiple times, I think five or six times, the aircraft actually passed through the eye wall. So you can see those little spikes. Uh, so that's a, you know, a nice, again, measurement that we can take with, uh, with the SFMR. And usually what we found is that the winds at the surface are a little bit weaker than the winds at flight level. So you know, there's a lot of data we collect. And, you know, it can often be very you know, impressive. And so scientists often can be quite impressed, but also they can be very tired. So this is not uncommon to see on these flights, especially at the end of a long mission and missions that happen overnight. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, we do everything we can to get the data uh, to better both improve our understanding and ultimately improve the prediction of hurricanes. So I think that's all I've got. Hopefully you have some time for questions. Awesome, thank you so much for that presentation, Rob. We do have a couple questions in the chat. David okay. is asking, how long does it take the LF radar to make one complete 360 degree scan? And how long does it take to process that scan? So it makes a scan, I think it's probably about every, um, I would guess every 10 seconds or so, something on the order of that. I don't know the exact time. But you know, so it'll, it'll take a sweep, and so we can actually look at individual sweeps. You know, we have real ways to monitor in real time, like on the aircraft itself, what those images look like, both the LF as well as the tail radar. Uh, but a lot of times, what we'll do is we'll take that information uh, and do create what's called a composite. So you know, we might actually consider scans over about a five to ten minute period, and so what that does is it kind of filters out a lot of noise, and so we can really put together a really nice picture of what the image looks like uh, from the LF. Uh, so, you know, an indiv individual scan just takes a few seconds, but, you know, a lot of times we do a composite over some period of time to kind of clean up those figures. Awesome, and Samantha is asking, are the drop zones recoverable from the ocean? They are not. Uh, we designed them, and I think over the past uh, many years or so, as we've gotten more, you know, uh, advanced with our technologies, we designed them to be as biodegradable as possible. Uh, but still, there are some things, unfortunately, that, that really do not uh, degrade. Um, the, what we figure about that is that the, you know, the benefit that we get with those drop signs, and we, there's actually been a lot of research studies that have shown the benefits to our forecast, in especially in terms of track forecast with the drop signs. Uh, we feel like the benefits outweigh the, the cost in terms of the environmental impact. But nonetheless, that is always something that we're, we're working toward uh, minimizing that as much as possible. Awesome, okay, and somebody else is asking, what's your favorite part about studying hurricanes? <laughs> Flying in them. <laughs> so, no, it's, uh, it is, it, it, I think John said something along these lines too, it's really an, an unbelievable opportunity, uh, and it's something that I'm very fortunate to have the chance to do, uh, and to work with the crew, you know, the, both the, the aircraft operations crew, as well as the, the scientists that fly on board, uh, you know, it's just, it, it's an amazing opportunity, really nowhere else in the world, 
uh, has his capability on a routine basis. Um, you know, there are other projects that happen you know, every few years or so, but in terms of doing it in a regular sense, uh, you know, this is the place to be. And so, um, you know, the data that we collect uh, you know, is, is kind of unprecedented, and Joe's going to talk about even more cutting edge research that, that we're doing. Uh, so, you know, those opportunities to really uh, learn about how nature works and ultimately to take that knowledge and make a product that serves society, I think is also, uh, you know, you can't ask for anything better than that. Awesome. And another audience member is wondering, what sampling instrument do you think provides the most return on investment for data collected? Oh, uh, that's a tough one. I mean, you know, you ask any person, whatever they study, they're going to say that's the most important instrument, right? <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I don't, I, 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 it, that it is really hard to say. I mean, what I can say is that we have definite gaps, even with what I described, there, there are parts of the atmosphere that we don't sample enough, I would say, and that we should put more emphasis on sampling more of. Uh, in particular, uh, right near the ocean surface, uh, we don't have a lot of measurements in what's called the boundary layer. And so Joe's gonna talk about, again, some technologies that are really getting at that problem. Uh, we don't know what the temperature and moisture fields look like in right near the surface. Um, we have a sense of what the winds look like, at least at the surface with the SFMR, but in terms of the temperature and moisture, that's really key to determining where you know, the transfer of energy from the ocean to the atmosphere is gonna occur. Um, so that's one gap that we have. We have gaps in, in upper levels. We don't really get good temperature and moisture measurements above the altitudes of the P3 within the inner core. So the G4 aircraft does fly high altitude, but it typically doesn't fly over the inner core. It kind of goes like the circumnavigations that John was showing. So those are also data gaps, I would say. So. Uh, you know, I think investments should be made in, in developing those technologies. And again, I think, you know, Joe's going to talk about some of those investments uh, next. Absolutely. Okay. And the last question is from Maya, and she's wondering how useful are drones? But I actually think we're going to use that as a nice little segue into our next presentation. Uh, Joe Sion is going to teach us a little bit about how we use drones to improve hurricane forecasting. So thank you very okay. much for your presentation, Rob, and I'm going to throw thank it over you. to Joe. Hey. All right, let's get my uh, presentation up here. I was a good segue. I will, I will admit that that was very good. Talking about gaps that we have, um, and I'll get into that. So let me, let me introduce myself a little bit. Uh, I will keep the record of two. We'll bring it to three now. I am also what they call a weather weenie, weather geek, if you will. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Joseph Sion. I've been with NOAA over 25 years. And you can see a picture of me here, slightly less hair. And uh, Rob and John told you about the P3. So you'll hear a little bit more about it. But what you're going to hear about for me is, is this uh, platform in my hand. It's a small drone. We're testing multiple drones. And we're using and leveraging, really, our assets. So we're using the, the P3. We know we fly in there, right? We've been flying for decades. So let's use this asset to help deploy uh, these new this new technology. So my job really at uh, the Hurricane Research Division within AOML is to develop and explore new technologies. So today we'll talk a little bit about drones. And um, if you have some questions, put them in the chat box. We'll have to answer them after. So NOAA's been using drones. Really, I started uh, working on the drone problem, working with NASA. Uh, going back to 2005, that doesn't sound like that long ago, but in drone world, that's a you know almost 100 years. So it's a long time ago. And here's a little movie. I'll talk over it since there's no sound. This is how we first did it. This was the first time we ever dropped a drone um, in a hurricane. This is back in 2005. You can uh, Google her, uh, Ophelia. My last name, Sion. Aerosond is the name of this platform. And we don't use this platform anymore, but I'm just gonna show you the evolution of it. So look at this, we strapped this thing, literally, this is the mission, by the way, this isn't some test flight. This is actually the flight that flew into the hurricane. That's the actual bird. And you'll see at the end, we actually get it back. So this concept of operations, you heard me say the word Kana, is to basically deploy a drone from land, get the team in place, hope that the storm, see the storm is coming up the East Coast here. We deployed from Virginia and fly into the storm and fly back. So while it's remarkable, even to this day, I'm kind of surprised and shocked that we actually did it because this is not a big aircraft. This is a, about a 25 pound plane. 
about a six foot wingspan. And um, there you can see, there it goes right off the plane. It's controlled initially by this guy. So it's sort of like a video game, you think. But once it gets far away, we use satellite to, to, to uh, basically control it because it obviously gets out of sight pretty quickly. So this concept of operations is something we were doing. Um, we were doing, uh, as I said, in, in, in 2005, and we did it a couple more times. Um, uh, I'll show you the latest technology. We don't have a lot of time, so I'm gonna cut this movie off, but that's the same drone 17 hours later, and it landed uh, on the tarmac, and it uh, should be in a museum. I know who actually owns it. Um, I will try to get this into the Guinness Book of Records uh, someday. Right now it's not high priority, but it still is a remarkable feat uh, for everyone involved, the NASA team, the NOAA team. So now what are we doing? So today we still deploy these small drones, but really, as I said, we wanna leverage what we have. We have these Hurricane Hunter aircraft and we wanna be able to um, basically use the plane as a, as a taxi, as a bus to get to the storm. Is a lot, uh, and then deploy the storm, deploy the drone in the storm. So you've seen a couple pictures inside the P3. This is not a drop zone. That's that's an actual drone going out the door. This is called the Coyote. This is the uh, launch that we did in uh, 2014. So we jumped ahead about eight years now. And this is what it looks like. So a little cartoon comes out, you can see it loses its leaves, sort of like the drop zone, right? But instead of a drop zone, it, it becomes its own airplane, loses the parachute, and goes down into that critical boundary layer environment that Rob is talking about, because we can't fly down there. Why can't we fly down there? It's too dangerous. It's a very, very dangerous part of the storm. So I won't spend a lot of time here, but in 2014, this was the first time we had an uh, air deployed drone in a system. So you can see the uh, orange X's here. The, I mean, the circle, orange circle with the black X, that's one flight, and then we had another mission that right in the eye of the storm. And then we had another one that was a little bit farther away and flow in, that's called, uh, flew into the storm. That's called an inflow experiment, different types of experiments we have. And then the next time we were able to fly was in 2017. We had six missions into Hurricane Maria, which devastated, uh, this is after it devastated Puerto Rico. You could see where we dropped the coyote. We dropped one on day one and then uh, actually two through four on the second day and then five and six. So we ended up driving, dropping six, and we dropped one more in Michael in 2017. Some of the highlights here, you can see the strongest wind speed we got, and this is the strongest record for any drone in any storm, 195 miles an hour. And we were only at 600 meters, so about a little less than 2,000 feet, close to 2,000 feet. And this is updraft, means vertical wind speed, so going up and down. So you have updrafts, and then you have downdrafts. And this particular system, it was also in, in Michael, we measured uh, updrafts of 32 miles an hour. That's pretty unbelievable. And the storm, and it it survived. So this plot here gives you sort of altitude. So think of this as being the sea surface temperature, sea surface here, and you're going up in the atmosphere. So this is um, about 3,000 feet here, down to zero. So you can see, and this is time. So you can see the plot. The, the our plan to use these really stays up uh, at an altitude and then steps down. It's called these step descents, and that's basically how we fly. So what's next? So that was version two. So now this is version three. We're testing new technology. We learned a lot from the Aerosol. We learned even more from the Coyote. And now we're testing two drones. The Coyote, I should have said, I didn't mention, about 13 pounds. So a lot less than the, uh, the Aerosol. This guy here is called the S0. It's only three pounds. Remarkable. Remember, the drop sign itself is one to two pounds. This guy over here is the Baron Wing Son and it's about eight to nine pounds. So it's still pretty light. It looks a lot like the Coyote, doesn't it? So, you know, we can see what these things do. So how big are they? The S0 is only two foot wingspan, as I said, three pounds. They all fly about the same, about 55, um, 55 uh, miles per hour or so. And um, they can fly about 150 miles from the P3. So it's really interesting how far we've gone. The Coyote itself can only go about 10 miles, 15 miles from the P3. So the P3 kind of had a babysit. It would launch it and then kind of have to hang around so we can get the communications back. These next generation goes a lot farther from the storm so that they can do more of the work that we want them to do. And part of this version 3.0, this is the biggest one we have. It's, a, it's called 
uh, the Altius uh, 600, and you can see pictures of it here. I have a short video that I'll drop to. This guy's nine feet long, so it's much bigger wingspan. You can see me holding it with the team here. Actually, I'm in the background, the team holding it. We just did a successful test in Maryland, and um, it broke the record of uh, the Coyote for 18 nautical miles. It blew it out of the water. We were about 190 miles from the P3, so very successful flights. This can fly about three to four hours. The original version of the Coyote was only an hour. I know I mentioned the Aerosol was 17 hours. That was gas powered. These are all electric. And remember, we're using the P3 as sort of a bus to get us back and forth to the storm, whereas the Coyote, uh, the uh, Aerosol had to fly all the way there itself. So this is uh, the drone that I just described, the Altius. It slowed down tremendously here. This You're going to see it coming out. It does not have a parachute. The other one I showed you, the cartoon had a parachute. So see if you can catch it coming out. Hopefully you can catch it coming out. If I did it in real time, you'd miss it because it comes out so fast. Here it comes. Boom. That's within, right there's about a second and a half that whole time we're watching it right there. You can see it tumbling down and then it ended up flying. So observations from uncrewed systems, aircraft system, UAS. Help us better understand these dangerous and difficult to observe regions of the storms, inc including this critical sort of air meets the sea region, which is the air sea interface. These unique observations have the potential really to help us for evacuations. How strong are those winds? Do we want to get people out of their way? Can people stay? Do we need to evacuate? So, drones really can help us in many, many ways. And as this technology advances, smaller drones will be developed. As I said, the S0 is getting really small, will probably get smaller still. And it'll save us uh, time and money as too, uh, as well. Uh, and we work with our partners and our ultimate goal, uh, as Rob and, and Jay-Z mentioned, we're here to help people you know, protect their property and even more importantly, save lives. So this last thing, I'll take some questions here. This is pretty interesting. People always say, hey, do you have a video? Does this thing have a video? It's not a video, it's called telemetry, but you can think of on the right there, the brown is the water. So this is actually what the coyote saw on one of its flights and the blue is the sky. So you can see it, it's almost like a video game. Each second that we're seeing, and I'm talking right now, is six seconds. But you can see how turbulent it is. You're getting thrown up and down and right, left and right. And this is the P3 here, it's reverse what you would think. This is, this is the drone, we tell it where to go. So the drone is going here next. And the P3 is staying within that 20 miles so that it can communicate back and forth. Pretty neat stuff, we're excited about what's next. And uh, we hope to fly more drones maybe as early as this year. So any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Awesome, thank you so much, Joe. Thanks for bringing us uh, into the world of drones and showing us just how useful these are for our hurricane research. We have one question from our audience. Um, how does seeing a movie or a video of a storm instead of only pictures help you better predict the next one? That is actually a fantastic question. And I usually use that when I have media interviews. People say, what do you get? Think of it this way. If you went into a crowded room, right, and you had uh, they gave you had two two seconds to take quick snapshots. So you jump in there and just take two quick pic pictures, right? Versus having a movie where you say, okay, go in again and you have a, three minutes and you can film everybody in there and you can see what's going on. When you come out and say, how many people were in there? How many women were in there? How many men? What the food did they have on the tables? You can't answer that with that first one, can you? The picture. And that's really what we have now. We have snapshots. Rob mentioned the SFMR that gives us the wind field. Uh, we have drop sons that occasionally give us a point here and there, right? So now with the drone, you actually get a movie. We fly down there and stay down there for hours in that very difficult to observe region of the storm. So that's a fantastic question. I don't know if the, uh, the question was from a plant in the audience there, but that's exactly how I would have described it. So the drone gives us a movie and right now we got snapshots and it gives us a lot more detail and it gives us information that then can be used by forecasters to say, you know what? We thought it was 120 knots. It's 140 knots because now we saw these different structures that we weren't able to see. We need to evacuate here or the reverse. We think it's 135 mile an hour storm. Oh, you know what? We, we sample down there. We don't think it is. We don't think we need to uh, evacuate here. We can leave this part. Maybe we evacuate this part of the coastline and that saves us money too. So this type of information gives us more what we call situational awareness. It also helps us when we want to diagnose uh, how well the models are doing. So we have more detail. We can look at the models that mimic the atmosphere and the ocean. And now we can take that science and say, 
hey, you know what? These drones are giving us information that we can improve the physics of the models so that next time or next year, when we improve the models, we get better forecasts, particularly for intensity change. And as Rob noticed, we've only improved intensity change by 30%, but now, if we have tools like this, hopefully we'll be able to catch up and make big strides in intensity change forecasting like we have with track. Awesome, thank you for that answer, Joe. And another question from the audience, do you think planes will ever be replaced by drones entirely or will we always need scientists on board an aircraft? I think in my career, we're gonna always have this mix of, uh, of people with technology. But just like, uh, you know, maybe someone asks, would ask the same question. Do you think we'll ever have driverless cars? Well, now we do. Do you think driver cars will go away? Probably not in our lifetime. If you go far enough into the future, let's take time travel and go 100 years in the future, probably you won't be driving cars anymore. So I would say there is a point in the future where we will not have reconnaissance, uh, where manned reconnaissance or personed reconnaissance, I should say, where we fly into the storm. We probably have a combination of automated, automated uh, drones like this and other sensors, satellites, don't forget about satellites. Satellites get better and better and better. Um, and we probably will have a mix of different small, big drones and different types of technology that will ultimately replace that. I don't think we'll see that for a while. And I think for, for the foreseeable future, uh, years and years, I think we will have this mix of, of uh, so the P3 like, like we're doing now, where we have uh, reconnaissance, with uh, technology taking a bigger chunk of it as we go and making uh, hopefully life better for everybody by in increasing the amount uh, of uh, predictability we have for these very dangerous storms. All right, thank you so much. And we have a couple more questions, but unfortunately we are gonna have to move on to our next and final speaker, Shirley Marilla. So Joe, I thank you so much for your presentation. And I'm going to pass you guys off to Shirley, who's going to tell us a little bit about how we categorize storms and a little bit about hurricane preparedness. Thank you. Can you, I believe you can hear me and see me. Uh, so I'll go ahead and start presenting. Uh, so you've heard a lot from uh, my colleagues here about the aircraft and the models and the drones. Oh, there we go. Hold on. There we go. Hi there. Uh, so, so as I was saying, you, you've heard from folks, uh, my colleagues, uh, my name is Shirley Murillo. I'm the Deputy Director of the Hurricane Research Division, where uh, all of us and Joe, uh, we all work for the Hurricane Research Division. And I'm going to take it back to the basics, and uh, we're going to talk about how we categorize hurricanes. You must have heard Cat 5, Cat 1. What does that mean? And we're, gonna, and we're also going to talk about preparation Hi there, can you hear me now? Just want to make sure it, look, it looks like, can you hear me now? Yeah, you're breaking up a little bit, Shirley, but we can hear you now. Okay, good, good. I, I, I got notification that I had lost my audio. So so I'm, I'm back here. So so again, I'm showing you that I, I too was uh, interested in science, not, not necessarily a weather weenie, but to me, uh, it, it was a, a storm, a, a very famous storm that, that hit my hometown of South Florida uh back in 1992 and maybe some of you uh, remember uh, that was hurricane andrew and my hometown was uh, devastated by that storm and it really was it really set the stage and it was the catalyst for me to really pursue a degree in meteorology uh, and so I, I i began interning and volunteering uh, so i've been with noaa for about 20 uh, 24 years uh, I've uh, started uh, as a student and now I'm deputy director. I'm showing you pictures of me here, uh, very young, uh, and during my first uh, P3 hurricane flight, which was back in 1998, and it was a category four storm. It was Hurricane George off uh, the Atlantic near the Caribbean. So all hurricanes are very unique. Here I'm showing you pictures, satellite images of, of uh, Category five hurricanes, uh, Hurricane Iota from last year, Michael from a few years ago, and Dorian. All these storms were, were category five in, in, in these images. 
And yet they, they sort of look the same, but essentially they are very different. And so back in the 1970s, early 70s, there were two, two, two gentlemen by the name of Herb Saffer and Bob Simpson. Herb Saffer was a civil engineer and Bob Simpson was a meteorologist. And they came up with what we know today as the Saffer-Simpson hurricane wind scale. And this, this scale was developed by, you know, as I mentioned, by Saffer and Simpson. Uh, and it was essentially to, to categorize the damage that you get from what it says, wind. And so they, they, they broke down the scale by categories. And so this schematic here shows the different types of winds that you expect from a category one all the way to a category five. Uh, which we consider as catastrophic damage. And you can see in the image here that the, the, the roof is blown off of a house. And so we, we've, we've had uh, all sorts of, of storms in these categories. Just this past year alone, we've had them, even as tropical storms, uh, make landfall this past year. Um, so this scale is essentially a wind scale. It doesn't, it doesn't uh, capture all of the hazards that a hurricane poses. Uh, so, you know, NOAA is actively working on, on trying either to uh, enhance this scale, make a new scale, or, or some other technique that, that can uh, uh, likely represent all other hazards. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, and, at, and ask the audience here a question. On what do you think causes the most damage in hurricanes? Do you think it's wind or rain and storm surge. So I'll pause for a little bit and see what you're thinking. All right, so the answer is rain and storm surge. It's the flooding that causes billions and billions of dollars of damage as well as deaths in when a hurricane makes landfall. And so the work that we're doing at AOML is essentially to enhance all, all the products that the hurricane forecasters use over at the National Hurricane Center and the modeling work. So, so we want to make sure that, that the, the products are, are actionable, uh, that, are, uh, that help you as a public make the decisions that you need uh, to either evacuate or, or, or hunker down when, when you need to. We are also collaborating uh, with social uh, and behavioral scientists because we want to make sure while we're collecting the data from the drones, from the aircraft, and that data goes into computer models and goes into the forecasters' hands, and they deliver uh, and they deliver that message out to you, the public. How how are you going to interpret that data? Is it going to be a cone? Is it going to be a color scale? Uh, so we are working actively with, with these types of scientists to, to better message our products that we deliver. So we're going to pivot a little bit now to talk about hurricane preparedness. Uh, now NOAA will be launching the first week of May, Hurricane Preparedness Week. So stay tuned to your social networks uh, and find out when you should uh, tune in to some of our partners and hear about uh, how to best prepare your, your house and, and in your community. Uh, for hurricane the season. Uh, so I'm just gonna go through a couple things here of, of what you should do. You should first and foremost, determine your risk. Find out if you live in a hurricane prone area, first of all. Uh, if you live in a floodplain area, does, does your community or your home uh, get flooded during a, maybe a, a heavy rain event? Can you imagine if you get a, a, a flow bowl, a flow of a category one or even a, a category five hurricane? How is your area gonna, gonna be impacted by that? Uh, do you live by the coast? If you do, uh, chances are you likely have to evacuate. So, um, so, so first off, determine what kind of risk you are, where you are. Have a plan, have a plan for your family, your household, uh, even your community or your neighborhood. Where, where, are you, where are you gonna go if you need to uh, evacuate for some reason? Uh, if you live with pets, what are you going to do with your pets if you have to go to an evacuation shelter? Will they accept a pet uh, if, if, if you go to that? Are you going to go to a friend's ha house? Are you going to drive uh, or fly uh, away from, from your home? So have a plan and, 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 and make sure it's actionable. Know your evacuation route. As I mentioned, that uh, you, you should uh, determine where you're going to go if you have to go to shelter. 
uh, how early you should prepare for something like that. Uh, so make sure that you ahead of time know that. Now don't wait till the week of or you know 24 hours prior. That might be a little too late uh, uh, to determine these things. And of course, assemble your hurricane kit. Make sure you have enough. Uh, I'm calling here disaster supplies. So you know I, ha I have an image here of uh, gallons of water. Make sure you have canned food. Most of us have have phones, so you want to make sure you have an extra charger around. Um, you know, now you have to have a you know face mask if you're going to uh, go to a shelter or anywhere. You don't know where you're going to end up. Hand sanitizer, batteries, those kinds of things. Make sure and extra medication if 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 you need medication for some sort, or or even if you get hurt uh, for some reason and you might need uh, medication for that, a first aid kit, let's say. Uh, so these are the things. You know, now is the time. I should say we're in the month of April. Uh, you know, start thinking about these things. Uh, especially your disaster your disaster supply kit. Uh, so I'm preparing mine, and I hope you are as well. So with that, I'm going to take any questions that might come from the audience. I want to thank you for your time. Uh, you've heard all of what what we've discussed here as far as our technology, why we fly into storms, the importance of it. Uh, so now I'll I'll take some questions. Thank you so much, Shirley, for that informative presentation. Feel free to ask any questions in the chat box. We're going to start it out. Somebody is wondering if you could explain the cone of uncertainty and what that means. Okay, so the National Hurricane Center issues a cone of uncertainty when they put out their uh, their track map, their track forecast. And so essentially is what they are doing is that the forecasters are getting a uh, uh, model, uh, weather forecast model uh, results, I should say. And each of these computer models, we have several in the United States. May, may, uh, some of you may have heard of the European model. Some people call it the Euro uh, mo model. There are many uh, computer weather models out there. And each of them are very unique and they give you different types of answers or prediction essentially of where the storm is headed. And so uh, what the Hurricane Center does is that they look at all of those models. So you hear people say those spaghetti plots. Uh, so they take those and they build a, uh, a prediction. And with that, you have an uncertainty. Uh, our science is not an exact science. There's always some error. So it's always good to know to to build an, a, a cone uh, that, that determines where the where the storm may be headed. And so that's why you see it uh, sometimes uh, a little larger than others. I could tell you that in the past, uh, you know, several decades, we've made a, a, in, in just an exorbitant amount of, of, of advancements to that cone. That cone now has gotten a lot more uh, sh uh, shorter or, or narrower, I should say, as, as we've improved the technology, uh, the, the data sets that go into the computer models. So, so that's essentially what, what it is. And if we call it a cone, as some people might say it's a cone of death, I wouldn't call it that, but it's a cone of uncertainty because right within those bounds is where we think, the National Hurricane Center thinks the storm is going to be headed. Thank you. And Samantha in the chat is wondering, how many days do you recommend having supplies prepared for? That's a good question, Samantha. I would say you should plan for maybe uh, three to four days, uh, maybe five, uh, no more than that. Hopefully, you know, you'll, you'll be, uh, uh, you, you'll either be rescued or, or power might come on. Uh, from my experience, I can tell you, uh, we've been in storms and I've lost power at my house for two weeks. Uh, uh, but, you know, we've, uh, we, we've had enough supplies for them. So, but I think a week's worth of supply would be adequate, you know, make sure you have plenty of water. Uh, so that's my advice. All right, thank you so much. And if anybody else has any other questions, you can direct them to aoml.communications at noaa.gov. That is our comms email, and we are do our best to get back to you with a response. As we wrap up today's webinar, I'd like to invite everybody to hop back onto the screen here. All right, and we would just like to give a big thank you to our panelists for these fantastic presentations. 
And also a big thank you to our viewers for tuning in with all of us tonight. And just a reminder that tomorrow, April 22nd, is our Coasts and Corals webinar, where we will be exploring coral reefs, learning about red tides, and seeing how our scientists are working to promote healthy coral ecosystems. And I will put the link to register for that webinar on our screen right now. So this is where you can register for tomorrow night's webinar using the link here, bit.ly slash AOML goes virtual dash coast and corals. So please keep in mind that this link is case sensitive. Uh, for more information on AOML's virtual open house, you can find us online at aoml.noaa.gov slash outreach and education. And you can also follow us online on our social medias on Twitter and Instagram at NOAA underscore AOML. So I want to thank everybody again for being a part of our Open House webinar series, and we hope you stick with us for the remainder of the week. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. Thanks.